beer. He got in a great heat back there. He's the one helping us with video. We had some trouble tonight, but he's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> he rocks. Uh, we have Tyler Reardon, scientific approach to SEO next month. Don't miss that. JR has an announcement. Tyler's awesome, you guys. You do not want to miss him. Tyler is really awesome. Tyler's an SEO manager at Chewy.com, if you love pets. He was formerly at Carfax. I, like, I literally love anybody that asks me to review the Python. But, <laughs> 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 so, that was good. Uh, so we're launching uh, a new conference in Raleigh this year. Uh, it's uh, uh, not that far away, so it's April 7th. Uh, we have, uh, it's going to be a beautiful temporary art museum in downtown Raleigh. We have Gary Eish, uh, uh, Google, uh, Noah Dav Davis, who's the Vice President of Engineering and Market News, uh, Frederick Dubois of Bain, uh, Mike King, uh, Ricardo Baez Gates, who's one of the premier researchers of Intent, which is a big buzzword, Intent, so a big buzzword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jamie Albrico, uh, really cool, and then John Anderson. Uh, so it's going to be a day event. Uh, tickets are $200, uh, and we're going to be donating all the proceeds to the North Carolina Food Bank. Uh, so take a look for that. That's findabilitycon.com. Findabilitycon.com if you're interested. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Jared's one of the organizers. I also want to thank other people to help with this. Rob is usually the one that does the announcements, not me. I'm new to this. That's why I have notes. <laughs> I have notes stuff. Uh, the camera. Matthew is holding the phone. Grayson does all our images. There's a team that makes this happen every month. Uh, I want to say hold questions till the end this time. Kevin will probably answer all your questions while this is going on. <coughs> so we have the VP of SEO and Content at G2, formerly Atlassian and Daily Motion. He's analyzed 100,000 keywords to tell us about CERT features. Welcome. Kevin and Woo! Woo. Thank, Thank you all. I hey, hope you can understand me well. Uh, I recently made a huge mistake. I actually asked my followers on Twitter what speakers should not be doing in the future. And I have a laundry list of everything that I'm trying to avoid right now, including rambling in the intro. So I'm just going to jump right in, and then later on we can go over questions and all that kind of stuff. So the title of this includes the word journey. And my journey actually started last year in March when I joined G2. We're a software or B2B software marketplace. So we deal with software reviews and buying software, comparison, all that kind of stuff. And as uh, Patrick was so kind to introduce me, I'm the VP of SEO and content there. So when you join a new company or just in general, when you consult a client, one of the first things you should do is just Google some of their main keyword and do some exploratory testing, you know? So I did that. One of our main keywords is CRM software, really important for our business, of course, also for other businesses. So I typed that into Google and see some stuff. Looks okay. Some ads, knowledge panel, not too bad. Scroll further down, some organic results. Perfect. Everything fine until here. Then I look at the mobile results. And that's when my neck hair kind of starts to raise a little bit. You know, I'm like, yeah, cool. Topic layer knowledge graph panel right at the top, giving away tons of information. Scroll further down. Ugh. People also ask box. Uh, like a whole carousel of different software uh, for businesses. Then there's like an about section. That's when I start to get a bit angry. Uh, people also search for that's when I start to get mad. And then videos, like these will take away all your clicks, right? There's like, there's nothing left for what Google calls more results. That's, that's the organic results. That's, that's where we want to be, right? So, fudge, not very good. Cool entry to the company. Um, so lots to work on. And then a couple of months in, our traffic starts to do a little funky dance. It starts to go up, which is a great time, right? You're sitting there like, yes, all my stuff starts to work. Good times ahead. And it starts to go, to go down. You're like, yeah, 
well, I don't know what's happening, right? Keeps going like that. See the same thing in Ahrefs, by the way, and we see the same thing in uh, our Google Analytics. So at this point, you know, like I'm, I'm growing gray hair literally right here on the way down. And at this point, I, I kind of start to look into some causes. And of course, I look into some feature snippets and other search, fe search features. And what you see here, this is from SEMrush, by the way, is that um, these are the, all the keywords that we have featured snippets for. And you see they, they start to go up, but the traffic kind of slowly follows, right? There's this little peak or spike here, but it's not the same type of curve that you would expect. And then in the mobile featured snippets, it's even worse. Like it's growing, but this thing is going down. I was like, God, what's happening here? So I keep digging further, and of course, review snippets are really important for us. And guess what's happening? They're flat in terms of the rankings or the keywords that we rank for, but the traffic is going down. And then even worse on mobile, it's, it's just falling, right? And so all these kind of SERP features are what cause all these traffic fluctuations, which is a great spot to be in, just saying that. That was a joke. Uh, and you see the same thing in competitors, right? So then I started to look, okay, what's happening to other sites? So Trustradius is a competitor of ours, Software Advice competitor of ours, Capterra, a huge competitor of ours, and you, just, you see the same thing. It's just up and down, up and down. SEO is freaking out all over the world. And then uh, examine.com. You might have seen that case on Twitter or followed it on Reddit. It was a huge thing where I was also involved in some of the consultation, and it just dropped overnight and it, it, it just came back. And then what I found eventually is that some of these featured snippets are what cause a lot of the fluctuations, um, which is not cool because you don't really get that out of search console, right? Like now uh, SEMrush added a new feature where they show you the, the uh, different SERP features integrations, but uh, in search console, you don't get shit. Is cursing okay here? That's one of the things that Twitter people said you should not do. So fuck him. Uh, <laughs> that's on camera, fine. Uh, Bulletproof.com, right? Then I went into different industries and verticals. So health, not looking too good. Consumer lab, not looking too good. Food, recipes, this like big website, not looking that good. The kitchen, huge website, has like major fluctuations, right? So again, people freaking out there. You see the same thing in, in, in uh, image packs this time for the kitchen, and I'll show you why that is in a little bit. And then you see the same for Food Network. So major size, I mean, look at that. It's like 20 or 40 million you know, visits. That's, that's not small. And so at this time, you feel like you're in a burning house, and you just tell yourself, this is OK, but deep down, <laughs> you're freaking the heck out. And I don't know how you feel about this, but I've been in SEO for 10 years, and I've never seen something like that. So the result or the bottom line is basically that we're at the mercy of SERP features, right? These bring huge fluctuations. We're not tracking them as well as we should be. And that's where this whole kind of state of the SERPs actually comes from. That's, that's kind of the whole reason for why I'm here and why I'm speaking at a couple other conferences about this thing. And so to explore what's actually going on, we have to take a step back, basically two years back. And what happens is actually that our best friend turned against us. So in 2018, Ben Gomez, the SVP of almost everything at Google, he's like news, Google Assistant, and search at the same time, which should tell you something. He wrote this article, which is basically a four article series on the Google blog about the 20th anniversary of Google, but also what the next 20 years of search will bring. And in it, he talks about three big shifts. So Google is going from answers to journeys, from queries to a queryless experience, and from text to a more visual search experience, if you will. And these three big shifts are kind of the theme of this whole presentation and of everything that we should care about in SEO. Maybe not everything, okay? There's still other stuff, but this is big and important, and we see the results right now. So I set out, I started, I wrote like an article, and. I titled it from search to discovery engine. I would now probably title it from search to answer engine because uh, yeah, it's, it's gotten that bad. And what's interesting is that in one of those four articles, they're actually talking about the topic layer. Super interesting, super exciting. And you've just seen this in my intro slide. So 
topic layer is basically an additional layer on top of the knowledge graph. So it sits on the knowledge graph. The knowledge graph is basically, if you will, a database of entities, stuff like names, books, places, brands, all that stuff um, that Google maps on vectors and is able to understand the relationships between. So Google, I'm not going to go too deep into entities, um, but uh, basically Google can figure out things and now they add topics on top of that. So that's huge, right? They, it's major and you'll find this in image, image search, you find this in all sorts of stuff. Thanks for taking a picture of my ugly slides. Uh, I, I literally did this in PowerPoint. Um, and then 2019, um, Sundar Pichai, who's now the CEO of Alphabet and Google, that was a career move, says that they're going to switch from, uh, from, from helping you find things to getting things done. Um, I didn't like that, to be honest, as an SEO. That, that was kind of uncool. So in all this frustration and anger, uh, I reached out to my friend Morty from Rank Ranger, and I was like, hey, look, I'm dealing with all of this stuff. Do you have any information or data? And the cool guy that Morty is, he was like, yeah, sure, I got you, no problem. So he sent me over um, data from the whole year of 2019, over 100,000 keywords that he tracks, mobile and desktop, and he basically sent me stuff for four different types of uh, SERP features. Featured snippets, image thumbnails, image boxes, and local packs. And we're gonna go deep on those SERP features to see what's been happening. The first big question that I wanted to know personally, because I have an opinion about this, is are local packs actually growing? Do we see more local packs in search? And I want to get a quick feel for what you think here in the audience. So please raise your hand if you think that we're seeing more local packs, that we have been seeing more local packs in the last 12 months. Okay, fair. I'm going to do quick math, and I'm going to say this is more than half of everyone. And that's also reflective of what I asked people on Twitter. So you see that about two thirds of everybody says that local packs are going up. And I was thinking the same, and I can't blame everyone because Google's actually pretty loose with their local packs. I Googled SEO in the Silicon Valley where I live, and it gives me a local pack for SEO. I'm not saying SEO agency or SEO service or SEO meetup. No, I'm Googling for SEO. What if I want to know what SEO is? But Google's like, no, that needs a local pack, which is kind of weird. Then I did some research, and in fact, the last bigger case study on local packs that we have is from 2015, from Moz, where they were writing about uh, three packs replacing seven packs. And since then, we haven't heard much. So that was all cool, and then eventually I, I dug into the data, I sliced and diced it, and what I found is that in the US, local packs are actually decreasing, at least on mobile. And I was like, what? That's, I can't believe that. Um, and interestingly, so I got data, uh, by the way, from three different countries, from the US, UK, and Germany. And UK is pretty flat, like it dips off a little bit towards the end, but that's seasonality. And then you, Germany is actually growing pretty interestingly, and it grows, you know, in these kind of spikes. It doesn't, it grows almost linearly, not gradually. So that was, that was kind of the first things that I found in the data where I was like, okay, that is not what I personally feel intuition-wise. And then I compared desktop and mobile for all three countries, and I saw that you see this, this dip here from like almost, like a bit over 35% down to under 20%. So now it's almost like 50% of a dip of local packs on mobile actually increases on desktop. So that was interesting. Again, UK pretty flat. And then in Germany on mobile, you also have this, um, this kind of increase, and then on desktop it falls down. So that was, that was, that, that shocked me, right? And by the way, I compared January and November because uh, December has tons of fluctuations from seasonality. So I wanted two steady months that are the furthest apart possible. So that was interesting. And then we had Gary Iish in uh, San Francisco at our meetup, and he gave away that they're actually looking at the tab clicks um, to determine when they want to show a universal search integration when somebody searches. But I'm a bit skeptical if people really search for SEO and then click on a Maps feature. So I'm taking that with a grain of salt. Anyway, second thing, oops, where are we? Here we go, okay. Rise of the ultimate answer. That's the second big theme that I found. Of course, it's about featured snippets. What I found is that actually in the US, featured snippets are growing like wheat. 
right? We have 45% in 2019 on mobile, uh, on desktop. That is a ton of featured snippets and 38% and on mobile. Same in Germany, it's almost doubling on mobile, right? Germany is being flooded with featured snippets right now and really tanked. And again, it's very interesting to see this gradual increase. My personal hypothesis, and this is like a sheer assumption, I can't prove that, but I personally think that Google is testing that. They're like rolling out a new swamp of feature snippets, see how people react, and then either scale it up or down. And in this case, they clearly scale it up. And then in UK, they had this big, big period of like March till October where they scaled featured snippets up for mobile and then they took them back down, right? So you see these kind of, these, these uh, linear uh, scale ups and scale downs. And that's why I think that they test this, see how it works for a while and then scale it back down. But on desktop, they just took it down and stayed flat ever since. So it's like a pretty flat line, uh, which is very interesting to me, but they still show like, you know, in 70% of, of uh, queries, they show um, a featured snippet. So that was interesting. And then of course, you probably heard this, that um, Google is not, or has stopped deduplicating URLs when you rank in the featured snippet. So now the featured snippet is actually position one, used to be position zero, now it's position one. Um, and that was reason enough for me to do a little case study on uh, 2000 featured snippets at G2. And what I actually found is that there were, the, 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 the changes were not that bad, to be honest. There wasn't a lot. So this is, um, this is desktop. This, sorry, this should be mobile, that's a, that's a false uh, title. Um, and you see the before and after comparison and the average is maybe minus 1% of click-through rate, but it doesn't pan out in a lot of traffic. So the impact wasn't that bad. But still, CTR on average for a featured snippet is, is 43%. You have some of these outliers that have like 70% or maybe even more, and then you also have some that are performing really poorly, right? So I think. What I take away from this the most is that you cannot take a cook, cookie cutter approach and say that all feature snippets will give you a high click rate, click through rate. It's really a case by case situation. Next, and this is really important, search is becoming more visual. And again, Ben Gomez actually announced that when he wrote this blog article in late 2018, he said that they're going to include more videos and images for sure just in general, more visual content. But what I also found really interesting is that they, that he talks about this model of hundreds of millions of fine-grained concepts. That was me. And uh, they, uh, they uh, that sounds a lot like, like knowledge graph to me, right? That they understand the entities and we'll, we'll see in a second how they show that in search. But he kept his promise and lo and behold, in March 2019, image thumbnails just skyrocket. And that's like, look at the graph. This is very different from the featured snippet, uh, snippets, which you saw much more fluctuating. This is steady. This is like a button click, whoop, 20% up, and boom, there it is. Deal with it. And then it makes perfect sense, right? We're all using Google. I, I really hope so as SEOs. And you've seen all the crazy stuff that they've recently been putting in, right? Like a video answer that shows you where exactly in the video you find that answer. Um, we've seen podcasts in search results, and then we see um, videos actually being broken down into different parts. So Google is not only showing way more visual content, it really understands that visual content. And there are theories out there that they might use the video transcript, which would make a lot of sense. Um, but the, the bottom line is that they actually show a lot of that stuff. Well, not everything makes it to the search and stays there. So image boxes, for example, they had a huge fluctuation throughout the um, search results. And uh, keep in mind that this is all for mobile because image boxes hardly ever show up on desktop, right? But that's Google's way to bring more visual elements into search. And then this is across all three countries. And then, excuse me, when you look at the US, it's also interesting how desktop and mobile actually diverges. So you see that they kind of run the, uh, a similar trend over time. And then in, in mid-May, the US results just, you know, they just double overnight pretty much. And then they're being toned back down and then they're in sync again. So again, Google just tests a lot throughout the whole search results um, and sees what sticks. The last finding that I had from the Rank Ranger study was that the user or the search intent varies by country. 
and that is also really important to understand. So here's, here's where I'm coming from, right? So uh, I think two years ago, I wrote this article about mapping user intent. And it was all based on the idea that users or researchers use certain modifiers when they search, right? You look for best CRM software, sushi near me, what is uh, Nine Clouds uh, or Clouds Brewery, for example, right? And that shows that you're looking for something specific, right? You want a location, you want to learn something, you're looking for information, you want inspiration, you want to navigate somewhere. There are tons and tons of user intents out there. Google officially says there are like five or six, when in reality there are probably hundreds of different intents. And the whole idea is that Google wants to serve user intent the best way that they can, and they do so with SERP features. So by looking at what SERP features Google shows, we can understand how they interpret user intent, right? Makes at least sense to me. And then I did something that will make a lot of, a lot of people cringe actually, which is then I looked at the correlations between the different SERP features showing up. And before you're appalled about actually somebody looking at correlations, keep in mind that every causality has a correlation somewhere. So just gonna say that for everybody who's like, oh my God, it's not causality. It has some value, right? And what I did here is that I actually looked at uh, uh, different countries and different devices, and then I just looked at all the combinations of the SERP features that I had. And what the correlation tells you is not only how likely they are to show up together, but also how strong that intent is. Because we have different search, SERP features showing up at the same time, and in some cases, they just show us a very strong intent, like here. So when you Google for something like, what do babies eat? You see a featured snippet and you see these image thumbnails. Um, and they have a very, very high uh, correlation, or I would say a strongly positive correlation of uh, 0.64, which is pretty good. And to me, that signals that the user intent is actually very strong because people want to learn something, right? They, they want to see some visuals um, and they want to see what, what babies eat. And by the way, I love this. Uh, where is it? The complete guide to starting baby on solids. There's <laughs> such an SEO that wrote that. Like the definite guide to babies. <laughs> SEO destroys everything. Anyway, so. Hear this one? <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> How many keywords can I stuff in? Kill the brand and just add another. Anyway, so what I found interesting here is that you actually see different correlations for um, uh, being very different in the same, uh, for the same combination, but in different countries, right? So you see that featured snippets, uh, snippets and image thumbnails have a high correlation in the US and on, okay, on, um, on mobile in the UK, but not at all on desktop. Like the likelihood on desktop is apparently negative to show up together, but on, U on mobile it is. So that was very interesting. And then you see this kind of, it's like a pattern that's running throughout the couple of weak correlations. So I'm not going to talk much about those. Um, but I was just stunned to see that this varies so much by country, right? So the least thing you can take away is that uh, SERP features vary by country. But to me, it seems that people might have different intents in different countries. So something to certainly look further into in the future. And the way that I, that I approach it now is that I use something like Ahrefs um, to track the SERP features that are being shown for the keywords that I care about. Um, and I track them regardless if I rank in them or not, just to see if for some keywords, new SERP features are showing up and if that might change the intent over time. And you can use SEMrush as well for that. I'm not, I'm not sad. Uh, Patrick might not, not want me to show this. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Whatever tool you use to track your SERP features, make sure that you have an eye on different SERP features showing up for keywords over time and if that might screw the intent. So to summarize that, four key points, local packs are actually declining according to this data, right? Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, feature snippets are growing. I think we all agree with, on that. Search is becoming more visual, visual and searcher intent actually varies by country. So if you have, if you operate in international markets, you might want to keep in mind that it's not enough to track SERP features only for the US. So far, so good. Then I reached out to my friends from SEMrush uh, because then I got hungry and I was like, hey, like how do we connect this to the other side? Like how do we connect this to traffic? So they were so kind, they have, like, they have a new tool called Traffic Analytics Tool 
and they were so kind to send me data from 1200 domains actually over two years also on mobile and desktop and i i couldn't wait to slice and dice that stuff so one of the first things that i actually found is that tra that traffic on the internet actually shifts and what i show you next might shock you because the biggest outlier and the biggest trend that I've seen is that Google is actually losing traffic. So in fact, over the last two years, Google.com on desktop lost over 800 million sessions. Okay, that's interesting. Dug into further markets. Actually, Google is losing traffic around the world, except for Poland, Russia, and Sweden. And I only have the relative values here, but when I actually, when I actually look into the absolute ones, you'll see it's not a lot of traffic that they're getting in these markets. Yandex uh, plays a much, much larger role, and Sweden is just not a big market. So that was interesting. And then I looked at mobile, of which I unfortunately only have data from April to November. So again, take this with a grain of salt. But also, and yeah, this is a beautiful chart, I know. Uh, but they, they actually also lose traffic on mobile. So that was concerning. And that should actually concern us all, because... What's been happening since Google's birth is that Google has been raking in plus 20% year over year every quarter in terms of revenue consistently. They're a freaking cash machine, one of the best running startups out there in the world. And so what happens when you have a declining traffic trend, this is desktop and this is quarterly revenue. And this little uh, smidge right there is mobile traffic that is also going down slightly. Like what happens when you have somebody put in a corner where they make where they get less traffic but have to make more revenue and get some ads out there not a good place to be in and actually the, the second biggest engine a search engine after google is actually baidu right we often say it's it's bing nope it's not bing it's not even the third one the third one is actually um yandex so apparently gets much more traffic and then uh then we have bing and bing was just taken over by dr go so dr Go has actually grown pretty well um, and keep in mind that this is desktop traffic. So I, I, I do admit that this might look different on mobile and something like that. So this is Google mobile traffic versus desktop. And you see desktop making this huge decline and then mobile taken over. And this is, I, I unfortunately don't have the historic data all the way back to 2018. So not 100% sure. I would expect this to be somewhat aligned with desktop, but I can only speculate. But it, however, since I have the data, it's way more than desktop. And then the same thing on Bing. So Bing mobile traffic is actually way more than desktop. It's not even coming close. And Bing is also not even coming close to Google. I think that's not the biggest surprise. But in terms of desktop traffic, I mean, look at the scale of the charts. Uh, the, Bing has like a percent of desktop traffic that Google has and maybe 10% of mobile in the US. But uh, you look at other markets and it's not that good. But in terms of mobile traffic as a whole, when I look at all the 1,200 domains that I got the data for, we have about twice as much mobile traffic as desktop across all industries. And it fluctuates a little bit, but that's, that's about the, the trend. But desktop traffic across the board declines. So this, these are all the different industries that I got domains for. And uh, if you add them up, you see that the, the trend is relatively negative, right? It fluctuates, but it's, it's in general, bottom line, it's negative over the last two years. I want to pull you one more time. Actually, I'm curious what you think is the industry or category on the internet that gets the most traffic. You can just shout it in. Porn. <laughs> yeah, I thought so too. I guess we're, we're post porn now. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually TV movies and, and streaming. So I guess all the teenagers are not having sex, but they're, they're watching Netflix now. Uh, and they're looking up words on dictionaries and encyclopedias. So that gets a lot of traffic. My theory is that we just have a behavior that is more, that, that we look up more stuff, right? Because we know it's easily available and easily defined. But then, yeah, porn is uh, the fourth one. No sub name. <laughs> So don't get it. Like we're not, we're not all the way post porn. We're we have mixed interests now, I guess. Jesus, I'm not going to get out of this one. I'm just going to move along. So when I actually move this, when I actually uh, map this out on a bar chart, it's very interesting because it shows you that the internet traffic actually operates in a power law, 
and I'm intrigued by these. I, I wrote an article about, about um, nonlinearity and, and power laws and marketing. I'm just intrigued by these universal ideas. But what you got to keep in mind is that there are a few verticals that get by far the most traffic on the internet, which makes perfect sense when I look at my own behavior. But what I also did is I looked at the traffic winners comparing 2018 and 2019. And uh, I did this for relative and for absolute. So here you find the, the bottom shows the domains that are ranked by absolute values. Um, and at the top you find it by relative values. And the pattern that kind of comes across is that um, accommodation and hotels and science and education seem to be some of the winner verticals. And uh, accommodation and hotels is all the booking, is all the Airbnb, is all the hotels.com. They've been gaining a lot. And then science and education is really interesting because some um, research paper websites gained a ton of traffic. Researchgate.net, Google seems to love that stuff and people as well. So uh, I think that's a, that's a good thing. We're watching more Netflix, but also looking at more facts. And then the traffic losers also, of course, search engines, right? Like we already got that and it's, it's just stunning. I mean, this, this takes into account all the search engines out there, Bing, Baidu, Yandex, DuckDuckGo, and Google, and the, the general trend is just not good. Um, also, the absolute trend is also not good. But then dictionaries have been losing, um, social networks have been using, which was surprising to me, but apparently Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, they're not looking that good. TV, that makes sense to me, and marketplace is all the e-commerce stuff. And then, yeah, ch ch children's health, that was a sad one. Like, minus 32%, so, oh, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> and then, one quick, sorry? It's because the content in that book sucks. I could see that, I could honestly see that. Um, st still depresses me in some way. Uh, but then Amazon actually lost uh, desktop traffic, so that was, that was interesting to me. But then Amazon is untouchable, right? Like when you compare them to, to, to Walmart and Alibaba, nobody comes close to Amazon. And by the way, Amazon is on the, on the second Y axis here. So they're actually 10X the size of, maybe like 5X the size of Walmart and Alibaba combined together. So they're still doing fairly good. And uh, I think mobile, they're doing good as well. So a couple of learnings, Google searches losing traffic. That was interesting to me. Um, the internet follows a power law, so a few uh, industries get by far the most traffic. And then accommodation, education, and science seem to be on the winning trajectory. And then def desktop traffic declines as a whole. And th that's no surprise to anyone, but um, I think it's good to, to get the data for that. So if I were to sum that up into two core points, Number one is that Google becomes more of a winner-takes-it-all environment, right? You rank at the top, you get a, top, a ton of traffic, or you rank in some search or SERP features, but in the regular organic results, you have, you have pretty bad cards. But if you play your cards right, uh, and you rank at the top, then you can get a nice network effect, right? So you get some traffic, you use that to make more money, and with that money, you buy more links and content. There's more, of course. There's user experience. There's like a whole lot of other stuff, right? But that basically is a spinning wheel. And so what we see more and more, um, and I still have to get the data for that, so take that with a grain of salt, is that the, the winning domains are just getting bigger across the board. Organic results don't get a lot of just simply attention, right? So this is desktop for another keyword that's important to us, which is expense management. And you see that it does okay here on, uh, you know, like uh, looking at the whole SERP, but on mobile, there's just so much stuff before that nobody will click on you down there. You're just pretty much lost. When you look at the data, uh, it's, it's just painful, right? So desktop impressions, we get almost 12,000 and we rank on average number three and we get like 70 clicks for this thing, right? And then mobile, we don't even get a lot of impressions on mobile. That's even worse, right? <laughs> so we rank number five on average. We get 300 impressions. That's like nobody scrolls even down there, right? And so another interesting thing that I found is that I was able to see a correlation between featured snippets showing up and, and traffic. So on mobile and on desktop, there's just a very clear, you can see it with your sheer eye, there's a relatively clear correlation between the traffic that you get and the featured snippets. Now to be fair, I think the number one result still gets a lot of traffic. You saw that 43% click-through rate in the, in the beginning. When you rank in it, you're fine. But outside, it's just, you know, not a lot left anymore. 
And then also image boxes drain a ton of traffic. So image boxes, whether they show up on, on desktop or mobile, they have a negative correlation of 0.7, which just basically means that if image boxes are present, it's very unlikely for you to get traffic if you look at all the websites ranking, right? Some will still get traffic, but it doesn't look that good. And I'll show a couple of cool examples in just a minute. But basically, Google is not a search engine anymore in those regards. It has really become an, an, a destination. And there's some verticals that are suffering under this. One of them, for example, is travel, right? So um, Expedia actually recently let their CEO go, and it was because of SEO. That's a huge deal, right? They, in, in their statements, they call out reduced efficiency from SEO and increasing competition from Google's Hotel Finder. In a shareholder report, that's actually a pretty big deal. TripAdvisor didn't have a good day in November at all. Like, stock price just tanking. And in the explanation, they not only they point out, but also analysts point out that SEO is the, the, the driving factor here. So um, you see this in, in, in this kind of report, uh, Google competition intensifies. That's pretty bad. When you look at the search results, it's no wonder, right? You, you Google for something like uh, flight F SFO to Chicago, uh, just came from Chicago and Googled this, and you see two ads at least before Google shows you their, um, their, their flight panel. And then on mobile, it's even worse, right? Mobile, you don't even get an ad. You can't even buy your way in. People, like, Google is just like, hey, here's, like, here's a great way to differentiate your business if you're an OTA. You can differentiate by price and by a little favicon. There you go, industry. Not that comfortable. Same with hotels, right? Hotel, hotel and rally. Again, no ad at the top on desktop. Google doesn't even care about that at this point. Um, and sure, you have some images, you have some price, right? But it's like all a very condensed list of things. And then again, on, on mobile, at least you have an ad, which booking is certainly going to block because actually booking is the only OTA that's coming out alive out of this whole thing. Okay, maybe alive is a bit exaggerated, but that's coming out well. So booking actually increased their desktop traffic by almost 50%. And Airbnb also did not too bad. But booking is an interesting success story. And that's where the whole story gets a bit more positive, right? Because until now, I was like, oh my gosh, this is coming at us, that is coming at us. There are actually ways out of there, and I want to talk about them. So what booking actually did is they increased organic traffic, as you can see here in SEM Rush, but they also increased their direct traffic. They invested a lot of money to actually build a brand. And that's what I would recommend anybody out there is play the game until you can opt out. All the Amazon did the same thing. Amazon is still the biggest advertiser on Google, right? But now they have such a strong brand and such a good offering that they attract direct clicks and direct traffic. And that's what, what Booking has done as well. And not only that, they make sure to keep that traffic, right? So it's not just enough for people to come to your site, but they immediately make you an offer. I'm signed out here, right? Immediately make an offer for 50% off if you sign in right now. And that's what I see as a second step. You build a strong brand, you get a ton of direct traffic, you make sure you transfer that direct traffic into an environment you can control, like email or like an app or something like that. Next, sports. Yeah, not good. Not so. Not not so good looking for especially the the um, the leagues and sports. So this is um, NFL, NHA, uh, NHL, and NBA. And when you Google them on like just the, the terms, you get all the results that you want. There's no need for you to click through, right? You see all the the results, the latest news, videos, replays, all that kind of stuff. Uh, mobile is even worse, right? Like. Why would you even follow any site or anybody out there if you're an NBA fan? You just type an NBA into Google, you get the top game and all the other games, and you get brackets and everything. And of course, it shows in traffic, right? Actually, the Premier League is the only uh, major sports league that, that gained in desktop traffic, and all the other ones, uh, yeah, they're, they're not looking that good. And mobile, uh, yeah, also not looking that good. They're just losing traffic left and right, because why would you still go there? You get all the news, you get all the stuff, right? SERP mazes, another thing that I've, I just, yeah, that's not so good. So actually what's happening here is um, I Googled for best graph database, another one of our keywords, and you get these cool thumbnails, which get a lot of attraction. So at first you're like, hooray, awesome, cool. Like I'll get all the traffic. 
not because when you click on them, you just get to another search. You don't come to the website and on, on, on mobile, right? Like this is our organic result. On mobile, actually Google is like, oh, hey, look, this is what we found on the web. That's from our site. That, they pulled that list from our site. And not only do they pull that list from our site, they show our competitors right next to us. You can swipe through. So yeah, not so cool. Let's keep going. Movies, it's Google for movies. You can buy tickets, don't have to leave the search results at all. You can buy them right there in Fandango. You Google for what to watch, you get a whole list of inspiration, and you also get the reviews. All there from IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes and Google itself, of course, which is coming, so these sites have to watch out. They're also not looking good in terms of traffic, by the way, at all. And then when you Google that on desktop, you get like a huge query refinement. So you get like Netflix type of data here, right? You get superhero movies, drama movies, zombie, Pixar. So they just crunch it all together, 90s shows. Uh, yeah, whatever floats your boat. Um, what to make for breakfast? Don't need to leave the search results at all because if you Google that on your mobile phone, Google will kind of give you inspiration for what you want your breakfast to be like. It can be fluffy, easy, or you get recipes, which actually when you click on one of those, you get a recipe right in the search results. You don't need to click through any website, right? Google will show it to you right there. And then you can leave a nice review. Cameos, that's interesting actually. So cameos are like a, you can, you can shoot videos to answer certain questions that will show up in your name knowledge panel. And so it's a weird social component, don't you think? It's like this weird social character where you can answer questions. And of course, it's mainly for celebrities. So, uh, I don't know, uh, Shaquille O'Neal will answer your questions or um, uh, Taylor Swift or whatever, right? So that has a big pull. That's very interesting. And I'm excited to see where Google is going with that. But one thing that I know for sure is that for me now, Google is kind of the universal competitor, right? They're like a business that competes with everyone right now. It's, it doesn't matter who you are because they sit on the top of the funnel, right? So they even rank for SEO, goddammit. <laughs> number one, number one. So not even that is left for us. So um, what can we do? What are we gonna do? Is SEO dead? No, of course it's not dead. But how to get out of this crunch? Couple things, I already spoke about brand and I already spoke about how to convert this traffic into email signups or into environments that you can control so that you're less dependent on Google. But we also have to start embracing mobile as the source of truth. And we should have started two years ago, but I still see desktop screenshots in all presentations and people talking about desktop left and right. And as I showed you in this presentation, when you actually look for the mobile search results, it's a completely different landscape and all the traffic is on mobile. So let's look at mobile as the source of truth. And so in fact, there was a third data set that Parsley was so kind to give me. Parsley, they are a publisher tool and they track about 3000 domains um, and tons of keywords. And they actually uh, found out that you get 20 times more mobile traffic, at least as a publisher, right? But I would argue that's the case for lots of verticals out there. Um, and you actually Google, uh, Google mobile traffic grew by 13% in 2019, and desktop traffic shrunk by, 20, uh, by 24%. So that's in line with other data that I have from other tool vendors and that I showed earlier. But there are also non-search features that are growing pretty rapidly. And non-search entails stuff like Google Discover, which is really interesting and I'm gonna to touch on in just a second. So that's actually grown at a pretty fast rate and it's even more extreme because almost 80% of traffic on features like this cover comes from mobile. So desktop doesn't even play a big role in this game. And then 90% of traffic still comes from uh, search overall. So this is where I uh, measure search against non-search. But if you, like one good finding or one thing that I realized is that if you had any kind of um, traffic issues in the last 12 months, just go to Google Analytics and segment, or go to whatever analytics tool you use and segment your desktop versus your mobile traffic and see what happens. So what I saw for us is that some of the, this is total traffic, right? And then this is desktop traffic and you have mobile down here. And then sometimes desktop is just flat. Nothing is happening here, but mobile makes a big dip and that's why total traffic dips. 
And then sometimes desktop traffic dips and mobile is flat and then desktop traffic dips. It depends on how much mobile versus desktop you, traffic you get, of course, right? But at least start there and understand what type of traffic is actually dipping. And then also I wouldn't share rankings at all anymore. I actually would measure something like share of voice. And I could probably give a whole presentation on how to build a share of voice model, but in essence, it is based or should be based on your own click curve. There's also a great metric in Ahrefs, uh, which I think is called visibility, um, that is pretty much share of voice. Um, but you can also build it yourself. And the cool thing is that when you build yourself with your own click curve, you can build the click curve for mobile search and for desktop search. And when you download your SERP features, you can even build your click curve, if you have enough traffic, based on different SERP features that show up. So super powerful, gives you a whole other dimension of tracking to actually think about, and will give you a much better idea of what's actually happening instead of traffic just going up and down like you saw in my presentation in the beginning. Discover, I already talked about that, be discovered. It's super important to understand that this is not search. Discover is actually a push model, right? So when you search something, it's pull. You have an intent, you already have a problem. Discover suggests stuff to you, right? And it's very interesting and actually, is, according to Google, built on two different um, factors, content quality and user interests. And they just, in their documentation, say, yeah, just build content for stuff that people find interesting and use high quality images in your content. And unfortunately, don't have much more than that right now. But um, Merkle was so kind to give me some of their data that they recently found. And what they saw is that the click-through rate is way, way higher than just in regular search. So people actually use that thing and it's pretty engaging because actually the, the discover suggestions are pretty good, I have to say. And it's definitely a publisher and news sites uh, play here. So even though publishers only have 30% of the market share, they get almost all of the clicks, which kind of makes sense because it's mostly information that you consume and updates and fresh content. The shelf life of a discover article, if it really rocks, is about three to five days. And of course, it needs fresh content, right? So there's another reason to just invest in content, whatever type of business you are, like you want to kind of try to get into Discover and you only do that if you pull out, uh, if you put out regular, fresh, high quality content with good images. And then they also found that there are no correlations between backlinks and social shares, which is really interesting because it means that Google has some sort of engagement metric that they're looking at. I'm not going to speculate at this point, um, but it's certainly something to look into. And then what I did is I actually pulled our, um, for one of our sites that we have at G2, I actually pulled the traffic uh, from Google Analytics, organic traffic that is, and the discovered traffic and just matched the days. And you see that some of that discovered traffic brings in way more traffic than, than actual regular search. So if you rank in it, if you can ride that wave, it can be a huge source of traffic. And I can only recommend you to, to check that out and experiment around with it. Uh, so if you want to do that for yourself, you can actually go to Search Console. Um, Google recently started to give you the data by date. So you can just simply export that, play around with it, see what works and what doesn't, and double down on that. And one thing that worked really well for us is just using a tool for headlines. There are a couple out there. I don't really have a, a horse in the race, but I would start to quantify the quality of my headlines in some way. And even though some of these scores are not necessarily science, like you want to start somewhere and really work on your headlines because that's what people see and discover and that's what makes them click, also in search, of course. And then another thing that you can do, and I haven't played around with it enough yet, but in search, people can actually, actually follow your brand or your entity. And I think that's going to be key in the future is to like really build that audience where people follow your brand so that they actively get new content and see more content of you. We want to go all in on SERP features, right? Like they're disrupting us, but we have to play that game. So uh, right for people also ask boxes. They're actually pretty simple because you can either just manually open it up and search and then see what people ask, or there is a tool that doesn't, the screenshot doesn't look nice, but it's called also ask. And it, it gives you all the uh, PAAs that are opening for a certain keyword. So it makes it stupid simple for you to just factor that all into your content, wrap it up in a writer briefing, give it out, and hopefully rank in all these PAAs. And then for featured snippets, I actually saw on Moz a really cool approach that works great for us at G2, which is called the pyramid tactic. And it's pretty basic. 
if you think about featured snippets, one of the problem is that they often show up for very simple queries, right? Like how long to boil an egg? And that's something you can answer very quickly. But for, for qu uh, queries that are not that um, simple and people will still click through on to your site, you want to start giving them the answer right away. And then you want to go deeper into the context and then into the background. So make sure you answer the question, first paragraph, so that they get that, but then explain to them why that is the right answer. For schema, use Q&A schema. Um, when, they, when Google wrote that out, there was a big of a uh, scandal, I would say, because there were some examples that showed that certain sites implemented schema markup, but then didn't get any clicks. I've now come to learn that this varies and it depends on what people are actually searching for. But be careful because this is, by the way, this is a screenshot from the, from the Google documentation itself. Uh, so I didn't take this one and it's for a query like how do I remove a cable that is stuck in USB port? But Google actually starts to show featured snippets for those. So this is the exact same query. I took this today and they're not showing a feature, uh, freaking Q&A snippet, they're actually showing a featured snippet. So use Q&A schema, but expect it to be replaced with featured snippets or other SERP integrations. Definitely worth playing around with. And then high quality, unique images. So this is actually the traffic of Shutterstock. They're doing a great job, by the way. Also in content marketing, I can only recommend you to check out their uh, trends for 2020. They built this amazing interactive microsite. It's a, it's a, it's a treat to look at. And um, so their traffic is going up, but they're also benefiting a lot from um, image packs um, from, uh, yeah. And so this is from SEMrush and it didn't include what it was, but it shows the traffic that they get from image packs. And it's like, if, like pretty much a fifth of their traffic or maybe a fourth almost comes just from images. And it makes perfect sense, right? They're an image platform. So use those, make those, create those high quality images uh, and use them wherever you can. And then lastly, reviews. Of course, that's, that's like my, uh, home turf, um, and there's something that I call the MAD method. So you want to you want to use your reviews to market. You want to answer your reviews, and you want to drive more reviews for whatever business you're in. If you're a local business, software business, uh, health business, doesn't matter. But as a company, you are going to be reviewed and talked about, and you rather want to be the leader in that conversation. And then what happens is you can do cool stuff like this one. So survey software. Uh, my friend from Qualtrics basically used our reviews from G2 and applied the software app schema and is the only result that gets actually little star ratings and search results. So let's see how much longer Google is gonna keep those alive. I'm not sure they've already taken down a couple of uh, uh, star rating reviews, but um, if you are being reviewed, and I, I would guess that you are as a business, try to get those reviews on your site, apply some schema markup, and get those beautiful stars in the search results because they'll give you a slight edge over everybody else. And then lastly, try to structure your content around entities. Entity is a topic that we can go really deep in, but to make it stupid simple, there's this cool tool called Entity Explorer um, that where you can just throw something in like Star Wars, like a keyword, and it will give you all the related entity uh, entities, um, and I think it's just a cool inspiration. You shoot over a graph like that to a writer, and it's going to like just naturally inspire them to touch on some topics that they might not have might not have had in mind before. Now, it's not going to quantify the entities. It's not going to tell them how often to write about a certain query and keyword. But I think this is like a friendly way to get writers on your site and um, inspire them to write about some of these topics. And then lastly, is just keep going. I know that this presentation can be very, you know, um, can come across a bit negative and like, oh my God, we're all gonna die and SEO is over in a year, so might as well apply for a different job. But Google still sends 50% of traffic to websites. So even though it's getting more competitive in the search results, it, we still get, bottom line, quite some traffic. And the alternatives, you know, Facebook, mm, not that much traffic. Google News, yeah, okay, that's also Google. Twitter sends over a little bit, but there's not that much else out there. So it is a walled garden. It is very competitive, um, but we got to keep going. And um, the, the bottom line of this is you can't win the game if you don't know how it's played. So now you know, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions?
That's right, yeah. And that's one of my theories. I think either people are using Google Ads, which I really don't think, or it's more going towards apps and all the other stuff that Google has. You know, like Play Store, for example, I know gets tons of traffic and all that. I didn't have that in my data set, but I don't think the traffic is just magically going away. I also am not sure if it's going to voice search, but I don't have the data to prove that. So at this point, I don't know. It is, yeah, I was shocked. Yeah. That's scary, especially for Google. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think I think they're like every big problem or every big thing is usually multifactorial. So there are a couple of things at play, right? I think Google diversifies their traffic a little more into apps and other things. I also think that people might go to certain sources more directly, right? We've seen that whole education and science thing going up. So uh, people might just trust brands like Booking or something else more, even though they annoy me with their scarcity fake whatever they do there one room left like yeah no it's not uh but uh but i think that's something that we're seeing it's just more diversification and people getting that behavior that they find a good experience somewhere else as well yeah that goes on a page view based level that's yeah, page view. Yeah. Okay, so that makes sense because of the rise of zero click searches and searches that have so many different features in the search that the page the multiple page views are all less. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's very interesting. I just read an article today, so I don't have this in my presentation, but actually Google stopped um, reporting on the average CPC in their quarterly earnings reports. So there are a couple of theories out there that some of the like CPC is inflating and that the, the ads are actually not doing them so well. So it seems like recently, and I don't know if you share the sentiment, Google just does, like moves very quickly and, and rolls out some bugs and seems to be in almost like a panic like state. And they started to suddenly report on the ad returns from YouTube under the roof of Alphabet, which look really good. So. I don't know. I mean, you can speculate from there. I'm not, I'm not you know, I don't want to come with any weird theories or assumptions, but there is a lot of weird stuff happening. Also, if people are, if people are finding that they want quicker and more easily, wouldn't that also prompt me to go to page views? Like, I feel like I'm also better at doing that in Canvas. <laughs> yeah. Like, I know exactly what to search for and kind of the way to phrase it, I feel like, in real time. I agree. I totally agree. And I think that kind of behavior always follows what's possible in search, right? So when you realize, oh, I can type a, a fully phrased question that sounds like I was actually asking it and it gives me different results, which they have now rolled out with Bird, then you do that more often. So it makes sense. Bookmarks list? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know, man. I don't have the data. I, I just, I know my own behavior, but I don't think it's representative for everybody else out there browsing stuff. So at this point, I'm unfortunately not sure. And along those same lines, there's also a bunch of the search bar tooling in, the, in Chrome. You know, how much of yeah. that is considered more of a Chrome visit rather than a Google visit? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Oh yeah. I mean it's yeah, just Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. 
It's a, it's sad to watch, right? I've been on the other side. I've been at Daily Motion, one of the biggest video sites that makes a revenue from ads, and man, it's, people are not feeling good in those companies. No offense against Daily Motion, they've pivoted their business model. They're fine, right? Like that, they opted out, like the New York Times, for example. But not everybody can do that, and having to just squeeze more out of that is uh, it's it's just horrible. But I agree, it's a dead model. I hate it myself, right? I go to Fortune, cool article, boop, bounce right away because. 50 things pop up out of nowhere. So I think that also, that certainly plays into it, for sure. So most of the results in the decline, was that data location somewhere? I'm not sure, I have to go back and ask, honestly. Yeah. But I, I'll find that out for you. Yeah, it is tough because I have a lot of assumptions, but I can't really prove them or feed them with enough data because I probably have to crawl a lot of sites and then match that to how the traffic changed or how certain features changed. I think that Google in general wants more and less links, which sounds paradoxical. I think they want more links, especially in some non-Western countries to better crawl the web. I also think they want to go away from crawling altogether, and we can talk about that theory. Um, and then on the other hand, I think they want to rely less on links to determine the content quality, which BERT, I think, and some of the recent NLP and LLU technologies that have been rolled out are just going to get them closer to. So I think in the best case, they would not even rely on links at all. They would just detract or um, pull the mentions of a brand and then kind of figure it out. Um, but yeah, I think we're slowly moving in that direction. So. To answer your question, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the impact of that. I can see different motivations for links and for why nofollow, you know, uh, or why Google changed their policy to nofollow. Um, but in terms of SERP features, I just wasn't able to determine a direct correlation or something like that. I think, it, so first of all, it depends on the vertical that you're in or your industry. I think some suffer more than others. I am certainly interested in diversifying my traffic sources. So it is hard because we saw that Google delivers most traffic, but um, social and referral is something that I'm certainly looking at. Social, not that much, but it can spark, it can build your brand a little bit, which is also something that I alluded to. And then just getting people to sign up for your email or app. So uh, where will we be in three years? It's it's hard to say because I think we're at some sort of an infliction point where Google is under tons of pressure because of the traffic, because of the expectations, because of regulations that might possibly come in. Uh, so I think that can have a huge impact over the next three years. But I operate given that this will just continue and that we'll still get SEO traffic and that, you know, uh, like th that SEO is not going to die tomorrow. Um, so I can predict the future. 
but pretty much like build a strong brand, get people to sign up, keep playing the SEO game as much as you possibly can, right? Because there's no real opt out. It's like a tragedy of the commons kind of situation. Um, and try to get yourself in a position where you are so known as an experience or destination that people just come flocking to you right away like an Amazon or Booking. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, you. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. And I'm from Germany, so I, I, I know both sides of the coin a little bit. Uh, Europeans are much more conscious uh, in terms of privacy. And it has to do with history, right? Like they, So what does it mean? It's hard to say. I think we have some regulation coming from Europe that is some sort of a good counterbalance to what Google does. I wish some of the cases would have been a, bitter, a, a bit better fleshed out, like ex especially the Google Shopping stuff is highly arguable. Um, we can go deeper into the cases. Long term, I think tech generally faces this situation right now, like are we going to be regulated or not? Most regulations that I've seen so far, like GDPR and CCPA um, or CPA, whatever, they've more entrenched the big incumbents. So I don't think we're at a point yet where a regulation actually hurts businesses. You know, look at Facebook. They got slapped with $5 billion and their stock was like, eh, okay, we're going to keep growing. Um, so I don't know. I do not know. Uh, I know that this is that consumers are getting more privacy um, sensitive and more aware of those things. I don't know if we have yet figured out the right approach to all of this, right? You recently saw uh, probably or followed this uh, shutdown of jump shots. I think it's a similar situation. It's not that clear cut. It's, it's easy to say, oh yeah, privacy, and they look at our stuff. I think there's also a voice for the other side. So it gets gray. It is hard to, to predict, right? I, I, I kind of, I, I get more, I get a bigger voice in these conversations and I'm, I'm taking more opinions, but I, I, I still hesitate to predict what's coming in three to four years. It's a politician's answer. <laughs> It's in a depends, oh. <laughs> unfortunately. And it depends on, so to, to, to smoothen that a little bit, on how governments will make that potentially a part of their votes in the future in elections, right? So we see that right now where an Elizabeth Warren or an Andrew Yang make this part of their campaigns because they know it's on the voters' minds. So I think that's what, I'm, what's, that's what this will also depend on, like who will come after Trump or how will this continue in the future what leaders will be elected in the uh, in the EU? Ask away. Yeah, 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 and it, it, it's very related to search intent. So one good example is Independence Day. If you Google Independence Day um, around the actual holiday, you'll see very different results than on every other day because that's when they show you results for the movie Independence Day. Um, and then what I notice is that especially on mobile, they have these facets way more often than on desktop. And that's what I think they use to know exactly when to show holiday results instead of the movie results. 
and who might be interested in those results. I mean, they have tons of data from location. So this is another, this time and seasonality, it's location, like where you search for it sometimes. And then I would, I think I see that also it comes down to personal preferences, but I haven't, I don't have the data for that yet, but I see them more moving to stuff. So for example, um, on the what to watch facets on desktop, which are 